All right, thank you. I'm Dr. Dacre Knight, and I just love that last presentation so much because it did so well to serve me better explaining some things from the doctor's perspective. So I'll be speaking to you about effective medical appointments from the doctor's perspective. I think this is really important because it's something that patients do wrestle with, obviously, as we've seen. And, and it's, it's something that doctors get training for as part of their medical curriculum is how do you prepare for a medical appointment if it's not something that the patients necessarily have education on. So I think it's important to give you that information here. There is also a disadvantage that patients have is that you don't have as many doctor visits as doctors do, right? It's their job. So uh, they are trained in these things on a regular basis just by trial and error. It might be a situation where they come right out of medical school residency and they're a little bit shaky at first, but after years that they get this practice. But patients have limited time to do this. So you want to know what to do up front and, and to be prepared ahead of time. So that's uh, why I think this is important to go through this. Uh, we just got a, a show of hands, but I think I'd ask a similar question and I think I'll probably get a similar response. So just want to see and start with a question. How many of you here today have some, at least a little bit of anxiety when it comes to preparing for a medical visit? Yeah, as I was expecting to see. When it, and it may be with what is going to be relating to the outcome. Uh, it may be thinking about preparation. What is the doctor going to tell you? Who is the doctor you're going to see? So I want to explain to you some things that the, the doctor might be thinking as well in through all of that. EDS patients especially have a Im importance in this arena because you, you face a lot of headwinds, whether it's from misdiagnoses, multiple visits, uh, lack of knowledge, and, and so forth. So it reflects on the provider too to, to face those same headwinds. I'll give a little just short background on myself here. I've got my information uh, just to speak on a little bit why I'm giving this talk. So I've been working in the outpatient setting for over 10 years now. Uh, we started our EDS clinic at Mayo Clinic in 2019, and we've seen lots of patients. We're seeing up to 34 new patients per week, so there's a lot of, a lot of visits, as you can imagine. Uh, a little bit further, too, we just had a child recently diagnosed with genetic, rare genetic syndrome, so I've seen it from both sides as a doctor and also as a patient and a parent advocating for a child, so I know a lot of the pitfalls, and I, too, would raise my hand as well that I have some fear when it comes to approaching our own medical appointments. And, and having a little anxiety with that. So it's something we all face, and I think we, we can all learn together that it's important to work together as a team because as Dr. Castle just pointed out, that, that we can reflect on both ways, doctors and patients alike. So I have a couple of things that I wanna go through with you two specifically, and my promise by the end of this is that we will be better prepared for visits to know what to think about ahead of time. Uh, we'll have a better idea of what a doctor's thinking during the visits, what are all those things that are going on, uh, we certainly know uh, what patients are thinking because it's what we are able to hear, but you're not often able to know what's the, the backside of that story. And then ultimately, what do you do with this information to use that to your advantage? How do you take action on this? So we're uh, in Ireland after all, so why don't we just jump right into it and find this pot of gold, if you will, I guess in this topic that will be the ideal medical appointment, right? So starting off, we'll go through sort of pre-visit, during the visit, and then after visit. Before a visit, of course, remain calm, right? Easier said than done. How much do you love it when someone tells you to remain calm? But if you take Dr. Castle's notes very well, you know all of their strategies that you can apply, which I think is so wonderful. I really wish I could just boil down our whole talk and make every patient I have to see understand and go through and listen to that because there's so much valuable information there. But the point being here is that, yes, what you bring to the visit with you reflects on how the visit will go and what are your expectations and outcomes you might, uh, might witness. Uh, so disaster, if anyone's not known of this term yet before, it's actually where we're talking about against the stars and where's the locus of control. It's the locus is either inside or outside. It's something you control or it's something that doctors control. Though there is some control that you can take by being specific with your questions, being specific with your symptoms and explanation. Put the onus of control on your clinician to, fi to figure out what's going on. Uh, it is in some ways the duty of a patient to explain things clearly and precisely, but it's the duty of the doctor to understand what they are and how to piece together. So uh, that onus of control, as far as the diagnoses go, should be on the clinician. What, what do we doctors think about all of these things and, and the information that's out there on the internet? Dr. Google, WebMD, all of those things, because when you want to take control, you want to learn about your condition. You want to be prepared for your visit, right? 
I personally think it's a good thing. I, I would prefer to have patients who have some basic understanding of what are the terms being used, what are the diagnoses, what are those things. The problem with this access to information, though, is when it adds to more of your anxiety, right? So when you have this information that brings on more fear and then it, you're kind of in, is stuck in this sympathetic drive that uh, we were just discussing about, you really don't even know how to voice your concerns, your symptoms, because you're so worried about what you've been learning about, reading about. So it can be good, it can be bad. Just be careful with it and make sure that you do have access to verify that information that you're learning about, you're, you're researching on your own, so that you can be either uh, validated that these concerns are real or that it's something that uh, is adding to an unnecessary amount of anxiety. You should know what you're coming into. Uh, you, in, in, when this uh, arises, it's usually in the area of preparation for uh, the visit. Does that mean you need photographs? Does it mean you need medical records? Oftentimes, I have patients bring out their phones, share photographs. That's fine. I'm, I'm happy to see. We don't always see those things that you can visit with at that time. Uh, that there's an exam that's readily available as something you might have experienced a week before or two weeks before, that's fine. Again, when it comes to medical records, this is probably one of the biggest things that draws anxiety to patients during the visit because they're wondering, what do I need to bring? Did I bring too much? Did I bring too little? Did those records come through? Did you have access to them? Did you have a chance to read to them? And again, the same thing I would say with access to information online, if you have the records available, bring them, but if it's going to add more anxiety to your appointment and it's going to affect the process of the appointment and your care, then just leave it aside. Rest assured that all the appropriate diagnoses should be made if you're seeing the right clinician, whether or not you have every single medical record available. So again, bring what you can, but don't let it add to the burden of your anxiety during your visit itself. Now, there are some ways that you can talk about your symptoms too, which may be more helpful for a physician. And just as I was mentioning about when you're coming to the appointment about uh, medical records, uh, journals are fine. Uh, so having information that you've been taking data on is fine. But when you're speaking about the symptoms particularly, there are some ways you can describe them. This mnemonic is what we use in medical school. So we teach training doctors the right questions to ask. Um, so we're getting features of their symptoms of pain, for example. Uh, what is the location? Is the arm or the leg? Is the onset of five years ago, 10 years ago? Character, is it dull? Is it sharp? Radiating, is it going elsewhere in your body, up your arms, to the back of your head? Are there associated features? Does it come on during sleep? Does it come on with headaches? Uh, time course, does it happen all day, parts of the day, for 30 minutes, for three hours? Are there things that help? Pain, uh, as far as cold? Heat, things like that, or things that make it worse, movement, jumping, lying down, relaxing, severity, scale of one to 10, you know, how bad is it? Just some things that you can be very specific about. Again, putting the, the, the locus of control, all of those information pieces that you get within you and then have the burden of the diagnosis uh, for the clinician itself as their job. So knowing your body is important. Now, as we also have also seen that some of you have had some difficult encounters in the past. You may have seen doctors that look like this. I don't know, is this something I look like here? I shaved yesterday, so I hope not. I hope not to be this doctor. But some of you have obviously encountered these types of doctors. So you might get discouraged, and, and why bother seeing another one? Why continue on this expedition if you've had uh, difficult journeys along the way? Well, it's important, and as, as medical research has showed, patient experience has showed that these diagnoses put you on the path to treatment that you all deserve, okay? And there is not only along with the path of treatment, but also maybe less medical visits, less medications, less time spent on these, and more time spent enjoying your life. So seeing a bad doctor here and there, I have to say, I know that there are bad doctors out there, uh, but just also know that there are good doctors too that are worth your time. So uh, when, you're preparing again, so medical records, lists, and things like that. Lists are good. I, I have patients who, again, bring out their phone this day and age. That's the place to go to lists, right? Sometimes uh, the old school patients like to write them down too. That's just fine. But the lists help reassure me that I know patients and maybe reducing some of that anxiety because they're able to ask all the questions. They haven't forgotten some questions. 
And I can see the concern and there's a patient's walking out the door, I don't know, maybe I didn't ask all the questions I wanted to, but lists are good for that reason, because you've gone through the list and um, you've taken the time to go through all those things that are on there. And this can be anything from symptoms to medications, medical records, previous diagnoses, all of those things are helpful. There are no bad questions. I, I have seen many a patient who has sheepishly raised their hand or stopped at the last minute to ask what they think is a silly question, but it's only silly not to ask the question because there's no reason to not have that reassurance or understanding uh, that you also deserve. And the doctor is happy to provide that. So gaslighting comes up, of course, and it's something that uh, is just part and parcel with the nature of, of the medical care that there is today because Part of it, I think, as a physician comes from the fact that there's so much training and so much education, so much test taking that's required, uh, that it's almost virtually impossible for some doctors to think that they can't possibly know everything, so they're encountering something that they don't know. How could that be? It's certainly not my mistake. It must be someone else's mistake to think that this is what's going on. Well, of course, that's a major error. But it's something that, that must be reckoned with that, it, that it'll happen. And again, it doesn't mean that you need to stop there. It just means that it will, it will be something that you might encounter, you might hear others encounter. And I assure you that there is a doctor out there who is the right fit for you. Now, where do you go to find these, these doctors? Um, so that could be your primary care doctor, it could be your general practitioner, your GP. They might know of others. Of course, there are databases. The EDS Society has a wonderful database where you can access lots of information on providers around the world. There are discussion forums, all these internet uh, forums and access that you have sites, access to these sites. Medical journals, if you're one to be a bit more keen on looking up more of the hard data research and things that you can see who are the authors who are writing these. And that's actually how I found one of the doctors for our, our child is, is uh, through a research that was done by a specific clinician. Uh, but you don't have to do that. Uh, you can just simply, by word of mouth, you can make friends in the conference here. Who do you speak to? Who do you know in this area? Word of mouth is fantastic because there's a lot of shared information in this audience that you can uh, provide and, and, and gather uh, together. Now, a couple things about preparation, again, when it comes to the visit itself. Uh, you would be surprised how many patients I've seen who come dressed head to toe in a onesie parka like they're going on an expedition to Antarctica or something that really is not conducive to medical evaluation as you can imagine. Just wear comfortable clothing, layers, you know, obvious things that you can, you can take off, uh, stretchy clothing if it's you know, not easy to take off. A support person, you may like to bring a support person, you may not, and that's fine, you don't have to. I would say it's a, it's a personal preference. I like it when there is someone to advocate for a patient on their behalf who might be able to maybe remember things better if, if the patient's forgetful and they can explain things better. Um, or they may be able to ask some questions the patient forgot to ask too. That's just fine. But on the other hand, if some patients feel like it's an extra burden or maybe they want to go alone, that's perfectly fine too. Because there is also this relationship that's being built between the doctor and the patient. And maybe that's better to do just one-on-one. -on -one. But whatever you feel comfortable with is perfectly fine. Just know that it's acceptable either way. And then lastly, be honest about your symptoms. Be honest about your medical history. There's no point in making up things just to gain some temporary satisfying, you know, some, some resolution in your mind when ultimately it may curtail your treatment. So be honest with all your symptoms, treatments, and everything because the clinician, the, I, I don't have anything as a doctor to sway my opinion one way or another other than to provide you the best treatment that I can. So now during the visit, we've covered all the things prior to the visit, how do we prepare, what do we bring, this may actually be the easy part because from here, all you have to do is just be yourself, be friendly, be kind, use all those uh, tools that Dr. Castle just went through. And it, but it's a chance to build rapport with your doctor. And that is huge. As I mentioned, that this is a team effort. This is something that you do together as a doctor and a patient alike. Uh, we both have the same goal. We want for the best outcome. So a chance to build rapport, get to know each other, uh, 
all those things, how to win friends and influence, right? Like, like, like Dale Carnegie would explain. So smile, know their name, know a little bit about them. Be friendly. You are prepared for this appointment if you went through all of those steps. So that might help reduce some of the anxiety too, which could curtail some of your treatments that might be missed if you're on the spot and not able to think clearly or calmly as you want to. The exam, if you dressed appropriately, that's the easy part. And then ultimately, during the assessment, yes, this is a time to ask questions, and there are no bad questions that I mentioned. So finally, uh, when it comes to the visit itself, if there are more questions, don't feel bad to follow up with a provider, okay? You, you have, of course, time and you know, things that, are, that go wayside, but don't be afraid to follow up with questions even if you miss something because there may be something that is missed. This is a book that provided a bit of a muse of sorts for this talk of mine. If you haven't seen this, I would recommend it. And I would especially recommend it to my physician colleagues because it does provide a good patient perspective on what patients with chronic illness go through. So ultimately, the understanding is that you're not to be blamed for your own illness. And that's what doctors need to know so that they can better apply their medical knowledge to know how to treat you in the best way. Is it alternative medication that needs to be used? What is the difference between alternative or experimental medications? Lots of things discussed here. Excellent review. And a lot of those things that patients may not think about that a doctor is thinking about too. So the best thing that I took away from that book too is the benefit that the author gained from the medical visit was having a doctor who simply just listened. Now, that's not always the case and, and if you have a doctor who's not listening, but that's really the best doctor. It may not be the one who's the expert and knows everything. It's simply one who's humble, who's willing to learn and willing to listen. Because there's a lot of things to go through a doctor's mind during a visit. This Venn diagram explains a little bit of, of those things that can be overlapping and overlapping and overlapping during a visit that a doctor has to think about. So a lot going on. So we want to make these visits as easy and smooth as possible so we can parse out all the details, make the correct diagnoses, figure out the right questions to ask because there's a lot of complex issues to uncover. Now, how does a doctor record all of these pieces and things that you might see in your medical records? Well, we're taught in medical school is to record it in a way that it would be easier for others to read, it'd be easier for you to follow. Now, Recently, patients have had access to their medical records more, so doctors do have to keep this in mind. And it's, I think, to the benefit of the patient ultimately, which again, benefits the physician if that's their goal to help the patient. But we have to think about it as doctors to make this information understandable. So in the medical notes, we have SOAP notes and HNP. SOAP is the standard progress note. That just stands for subjective, objective assessment and plan. Uh, that's what every medical student learns, how they're taking notes on a progress note. So you're getting the subjective complaints or symptoms from a patient. How are they feeling? You get the objective information. So you get the lab data. You get the physical exam data. You make your assessment. This is a 43-year-old female with HSD who has headaches, and she's taking Tylenol that's not helping. So then you make your plan. So these are the steps that I'm going to take. These are the diagnoses. That's what you will see in your medical records. Now, H&P is simply the initial version of that. So you're taking a full history and physical exam. So lots of historical information on the patient is taken here. It's usually long, much longer than a soap note. So we get family history, social history, medical history, surgical history, all of those other aspects that lead into our understanding of what's going on with the patient. And then ultimately go through a physical exam and have assessment and plan as well. So that's what you'll see in your medical records and that's why we take them so we can keep track of them. Now, on to the third section. So after the visit, what do you do next? What are your next steps? How do you take action on this information to use it to your advantage? So if you do have access to your medical records, use that. Go and find your, your information that the doctor had taken on you so that you understand you're on the same page. I have patients often who, who point out to me, it's like, well, this was the treatment discussion, but I thought we were going to do this. And then we have another discussion, like, yes, I'm glad you asked that because first we need to do this test before we start this medication and so forth. So if you have that understanding of what is in your treatment plan, then therefore patients will be better to apply that plan. And, and stick to it. 
So actually, it's your records. Question it if you don't agree with it or if you, if you don't understand it. And then when it comes to further follow-up, more data is just fine. It's something that's useful to have. So whether it comes in the form of Fitbit, Apple Watches, wearables, whatever devices you have, tracking your heart rate, blood pressure, uh, anything that you can do to gain more information for the next visit is, is good to have. Uh, medication, side effects, tolerance, all those things. So that's to your advantage to know what will ultimately be the outcome uh, for other various treatments that might be explored. And then share your records with other doctors, other specialists you might be seeing, share that information. I want to know what other types of treatments my patients are having from other specialists. Uh, why are they doing that? I, if I can read the doctor's note, if I can read the clinical notes, the summary, then that's fantastic. And, and we're all on the same page, especially if we're coming from areas that don't fit in under the same clinic or in the same building. And that's in today's age, that's how often medical care is now, right? So in summary, we've gone through a lot and I think we have a, a good understanding now of pre-visit planning, say how to be better prepared. Uh, you are prepared. We talked about why is there some anxiety when it comes to the medical visit? Why is it important? Why is it especially important for patients with EDS and HSD? Because there is so much going on. There may have been misdiagnoses, bad encounters with doctors, uh, but why is it also important to continue on the path? Because there are doctors out there who will be helpful. Um, maybe understanding what's going on during the visit, what's going on in the doctor's mind during the visit. There's a lot to think about. Uh, every patient is unique. As, as we know, there's no two patients exactly alike when it comes to EDS and HSD. So there's no cookie cutter recipe that any doctor can apply for patients such as yourself. So there's a lot to think about. So it's very important to make these visits to streamline and work together as a team as much as possible. And do understand that when you apply all these things, you are on the right path. Uh, there may be some obstacles along the way. We know this happens. Uh, then there is a clinical team to back you up, to help you along the way. And that will be, that will be on your side. That's the best case scenario that we can, we can do. Uh, so ultimately when all those things are applied, so this is an Icelandic saying, Thetaretis, so it will be okay. Now, this probably is better uh, going into an, an explanation of why there's anxiety, how to manage the anxiety, but when we're better prepared, definitely the anxiety is, is better alleviated, and then we will have a better appointment and it will be okay. Uh, because when it comes down to it, uh, there is a, there's a saying that we're taught at Mayo Clinic that the, the goal of medicine is to, uh, to treat the patient, to, uh, to do what we need to do to cure a disease. The ideal of medicine is to no longer need doctors, right? And until then though, we're not there yet. We do need doctors and we do need to have this, uh, this strong relationship, this friendly, kind, this beneficial, proactive relationship between doctors and patients so that ultimately you will find your pot of gold, that ideal medical appointment that you all deserve. So we'll leave it at that. Thank you all. God to take questions later.